distinguished guests, dear colleagues, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. MEP, Mr. Charneki, I'd like to welcome you all to this online event, Refugee Children and Education, Inclusion and Improvement for a Better Future, which is hosted by European Parliament, EU, Turkey, Friendship Group, and Assam Brussels. Behind this online event, there is quite amount of hard work done by a lot of person. I'd like to thank you. Thank uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them all. To start with, I want to give you some brief information about Assam and who we are. The Association for Solidarity with Asylum Seekers and Migrants was established in 1995 in Ankara. Assam is an independent, impartial, and a non-profit association to assist refugees and asylum seekers living in Turkey. 25 years of experience brought us implementing partnerships with all the UN agencies, German Development Corporation, and many other national and international organizations. Assam is the first organization in Turkey having the concept of asylum seeker in its name. Assam has been providing social and legal support for the refugees and asylum seekers with 55 offices in 31 provinces in Turkey and with more than 1,500 full-time staff. We've opened our first representation in Athens in 2016 and it is followed by Belgium Brussels in 2019. I don't want to talk much and bore you because I know that there are a lot of person waiting to bring value to this online event, but I would just like to express a little bit of my feelings about this particular concept, which is help. What would be the situation that you think you need help the most? My answer to that question would be when I feel lonely and I feel without hope. So think of a person in a situation when that is so near, so close, and think of a person coming from a foreign soil after the most dangerous journey that anyone could ever imagine. And think of this person offered help on this foreign soil when he or she needed it the most, provided shelter, food, protection, education. So this is why I value humanitarian aid. And we are going to talk about humanitarian aid and a specific part of it, which is education, education for refugee children. So in a couple of minutes, we will watch a mini concert from a choir of refugee children for whom the most dangerous journey of their lifetime was not just a scary movie, but reality. But they're in good hands now, perfectly well. al Farah Refugee Children Choir was established in 2017, and they practice every Saturday for more than three hours. Well appreciated. You don't have to know the language that they are going to sing in, what we need to do is just hear their voices. Ladies and gentlemen, Alfara Refugee Children Choir is with us now. These kids are singing about peace and how it will bring their smiles back. It's a song that resonates here. These children are all refugees, most of them from Aleppo in neighbouring Syria. Now they're also members of a choir, the Al Farah Centre in Ankara. I came from Aleppo five years ago with my parents and siblings. I didn't know how to play guitar and I learned it here and now I'm so happy. As many as 200 children come to the centre every day. They say it's a safe space for them. I started to come to this center in the summer. It's so nice in here. It makes us happy. It feels like a family. 
The teachers say they're learning here too. We've learned to appreciate life from them. We've learned it must go on under any conditions, no matter what you've been through. You should hold on to life with everything you have. And the music really helps the children connect with each other. Children picked the name of the centre. It means my happiness. It's a sign of hope from them and a path towards what looks like a brighter future.
We're back. We're live on this special event, Refugee Children and Education, Inclusion and Improvement for a Better Future, which is sponsored, which is hosted by EU Turkey Friendship Group and Assam Brussels. Now we are moving to the opening statements. I would like to introduce you, Ms. Ipek Tektemir first. Uh, Ipek Tektemir received a bachelor's degree in translation and interpretation from Atalum University in 2010. She earned her master's degree in MBA from Atalum University as well in 2017. Besides being the European Parliament Secretary General of EU Turkey Friendship Group, she is indeed an education expert. After working on the field, she came to Brussels and she started her career at the European Parliament. When she came to Brussels, she said, I will never gonna regret it, but the weather makes her regret from uh, time to time, I think, huh? What a lovely day in Brussels, Ipek. Nice to have you. The floor is yours. I mean, at least the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Indeed, my, uh, for the uh, lovely word. And uh, thank you for providing this opportunity for us. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies and dear guests, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this online event on this very crucial topic. I'm here as the General Secretary of the EU-Turkey Friendship Group. I spent most of my career dealing with international educational programs which bring education access to all children, including disadvantaged groups. I would like to start thanking Atam and in particular Murat Baruch Korat for coordinating this event and for all, for all of you joining today. With this background, and in my personal capacity, I believe it is vital that we deepen the topic and discuss it between professional practitioners, academia, NGOs, decision makers, as well as the diplomatic community. We are all aware of children in every country are struggling with the impact of COVID-19. An entire generation has had its education disrupted. Imagine a refugee child before the pandemic already was in a disadvantaged situation. According to UNFCR report, nearly 3.7 million refugee children are out of school. The New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants pinpoints education as a crucial element of the international refugee response. Today, we are striving towards the Sustainable Development Goal number four, which aims at delivering inclusive and quality education for all and to promote lifelong learning. The problem is that today, COVID-19 could put that goal beyond the reach. The pandemic has exposed gaps, not just in providing education as such, but also in connectivity, access to clean water and housing transport and employment opportunities. Certainly, all of which have direct impact on a child's ability to learn. At the same time, I would like to emphasize that during the ongoing pandemic, refugees and host communities, teachers, private sector, partners, innovators have found numerous way, ways to keep the education continuing. This has taken resourcefulness. Today, we are here to emphasize the importance of partnership and creati creative thinking and exchange of the best of each country's experiences. Turkey, for example, hosts uh, one of the biggest refugee community worldwide. And we hear later from our colleagues on this topic today. We have to rethink and redefine the future of education. We need to bring the spirit to the field of education and develop meaningful technological long-term solutions for formal schooling. To achieve this, we need to forge lasting alliance across sectors. I believe 
technology can play an important role providing increased access to learning opportunities and it can complement existing education. There are a number of promising practices and initiatives which high, highlight how existing technology used by refugee populations can boost refugee children's learning. We need a stronger partnership between education experts and technology companies, as well as the national and international authorities. It would be a huge step forward for refugee resilience, staff re reliance and opportunity and giving a boost to patient and determination of millions of young people. I am very pleased to bring this crucial topic into awareness of a different perspective with the collaboration of ASAM and the EU-Turkey Friendship Group. Thank you. Murat Bey, we can't hear you, uh, Mr. Murat. I'm struggling with technology as well. When it comes to technology, I'm so limited. I'm limited with the remote control of my television. Just, just, I'm sorry. So uh, let's move forward. And it's time to hear from our ambassador, permanent representative of Turkey to EU, Mehmet Kemal Bozay. Upon graduating from International Relations, Department of Middle East Technical University, Ambassador Bozai joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1989. Ambassador Bozai presented his credentials to Donald Tusk, former president of the European Council, on 24th of January 2019. And he has been nothing but supportive since then to our efforts here in Brussels. We appreciate it. And Mr. Bozai, the floor is yours. Thank you, Murat. Uh, distinguished participants, it's a big honor for me to be here together with you. It's a very timely occasion. I would like to start to thank the EU-Turkey Friendship Group and IPEC uh, in person and its chair, distinguished MEP, Mr. Sarneski, for his efforts and also ASAM, uh, General Coordinator, Mr. Kavlak and Murat Yorsal, uh, Murat Koral as Brussels representative. I am also thankful for the participation of the minister. Uh, represent, uh, representative here in, uh, I, I mean, in Ankara, I believe. Uh, as philosopher Ali Gibran says, children are living arrows that are sent to the sent to forth to the future. So the title of our event is self-explanatory, and it is also very convenient with the philosopher's words. Refugee children and education, inclusion and improvement for a better future. We should throw them, we should provide them a better future because they are the future of our region. They are the future of their own country. They are the future of the world. And they are the arrows in peaceful way traveling to the future. The conflict in Syria is now well in its ninth year. And according to UN figure, 13.5 million Syrians are in dire need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Out of these six million are children, it's a big number, and four million live in so-called hard to reach areas. Today, the number of the registered Syrian refugees in Turkey has reached 3.650,000, of which almost 60% are children. The total number of the Syrian children of school age is 1,200,000 they are in between the age of five and 17. Out of these 750,000 Syrian children have access to primary and secondary education in Turkey, school education in Turkey. The challenge is that only 62% of the school age children have the access to education. But I would like to emphasize here it was around 30% in 2016. We are constantly working on increasing this number through our public institutions through with, uh, with cooperation with international organizations and with EU, of course. Education of Syrian children is of crucial importance since, as I mentioned, they will be the ones to rebuild their country in the future. And around to the, uh, among them, there are already uh, grown-ups 
uh, having 20,000 Syrians pursue higher education in Turkey. The challenge is big and it continues and we need to cooperate. We should have coordination. We should gather our efforts and we should share the burden. Even if the military flows from Syria stops now, the newborn Syrians in Turkey keep increasing. So far, we had 350,000 Syrian babies were born in Turkey. We need to talk, uh, talk, talk and think about their education in advance. And then, we, you know, there's a famous agreement between EU and uh, Turkey. This uh, EU-Turkey statement of 18 March 2016, which includes 3 billion of euro for 16 and 17, and 3 billion for 2018 and uh, 2019. We are already have a big delay because all these projects had, uh, had to be completed at the end of 2019. Now we are in 2021. Out of this, uh, out of six billion euros, approximately one billion four hundred fifty-five thousand euros are dedicated to projects in education sector. They are implemented with the collaboration of Ministry of National Education and certain international organizations, including UNICEF, KFW, World Bank, GIS, Council Worldwide, Stitching Spark, and DAAD. Education sector projects cover. 24.2% of the total facility fund is 6 billion euros. The realization rate of FRIP in education sector is 56.8% as of December 2020. Under FRIP, there are two important projects on education. One is promoting integration of Syrian kids into the Turkish education system, big test, and conditional cash transfer for education, CCTE. Big test projects provide Turkish language teaching together with backup education classes. The purpose is to enable Syrian children to catch up their Turkish peers in education. Whereas CCT program support poor refugee families to send their children to school. Under CCT families receive financial support every two months via Kızılay on the condition uh, that ch child has an average monthly attendance rate of 80%. These two projects PICTES and CCTE play a crucial role for the Syrian children's education. Their continuity is vital for them and for us. And when we look at the future, as uh, it is the title of our uh, event, as I said, 60% approximately uh, of the 1.2 uh, million school age Syrian children are living in Turkey and uh, the, these babies I just mentioned. Whether they stay in Turkey or return to their own country, satisfying their education needs are key for the stability of the region in the future. And I'm sure that UNICEF report that all, uh, you, you all check, uh, having detailed information, detailed uh, perspectives uh, for uh, these uh, future endeavors. Turkey, uh, the, the existing EU funding under facility for Syrian in Turkey will end in 2021. If it ends abruptly, crucial projects such as PICTES and CCT will be deprived of enough funding to continue. This is, that is why we are urging the EU to continue necessary funding for the Syrian in Turkey, particularly for the education and employment of the young generation. And the Commission, as the institution directly involved in the implementation of FRIT, knows very well that the projects created under FRIT must continue. We need the support of the Commission, Parliament, and Council. Therefore, this event, I would like to rethink Assam and also parliamentary, our friendship group and all the participants, as this event is a very timely warning to all of us to fulfill our responsibilities to provide a better future to the Syrian children through providing proper education and also sharing the burden for the future of the region and for the future of the uh, the, the, the Syrian children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And as you quoted, children are peaceful arrows to the future, yes. And yes, we have to share the burden with some other uh, partners. Yo. So uh, we're moving to Mr. Richard Charnecki, Chair of the European Parliament, EU-Turkey Friendship Group and Vice Chair of the European Parliament. Let me introduce you. He obtained his bachelor's degree as well as his master's degree in Department of History 
at Wroclaw University in Poland. He started his career as an archivist <laughs> and then moved to journalism. So let me perform a joke here. Be careful what you say today because the things you might say here is going to be well noted by Mr. Richard Czarnecki, I assume. He was elected to European Parliament in 2004 and he is the chair of the EU-Turkey Friendship Group and vice chair of the European Parliament and he is also a fan of Ankara Gücü uh, as you can see in the background and he, has a, uh, he is also a fan of Galatasaray, <laughs> I guess. He is just... He is not just a friend of Turkey, he is a friend of Turkish football as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Richard Czarnecki. Thank you very much indeed for a very kind uh, introduction. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, dear guests, uh, on behalf of the EU-Turkey Friendship Group, I would like to start thanking the Association for Solidarity with uh, Asylum Seekers and Migrants, ASAM, in particular, Murat Baris Koralp for making this event possible for us today. It's a great privilege uh, and uh, great honor for me uh, to address uh, all of uh, you with a participation uh, of Chief of UNICEF Turkey and General Coordinator Asam Ibrahim Kavlak on this crucial issue. Before I start, um, I would like to brief you about EU-Turkey Friendship Group. Uh, our stru structure, uh, the EU-Turkey Friendship Group, is a cross-party, non-partisan platform uh, that promotes high-level dialogue among European and uh, Turkish policymakers, business community, uh, and civil, civil society. Uh, in order to bring Turkey and uh, the EU closer and support its aspiration to be full um, uh, membership. Uh, a friendship group aims to analyze and uh, highlight important issues emanating from Turkey's geostrategic uh, position uh, and uh, put uh, Turkey into uh, a broader context. Uh, mm, these issues will be analyzed and discussed uh, through cultural and soft diplomacy activities with the mm, broad participation of civil society and uh, business uh, communities. Through critical uh, but constructive debates, uh, uh, smart mm, parliamentary and diplomacy activities Friendship Group aims to promote the actions needed to uh, intensify relations between uh, Ankara, between Turkey and the European Union institutions, as well as uh, member states, include my country, uh, Poland. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, uh, guest, uh, number of uh, people uh, uh, forcibly displaced, uh, displaced across the world due to conflict, violence uh, and uh, persecution uh, hit record level. It's a pity. As the refugee crisis becomes a serious global matter, we uh, acknowledge and value contribution of Turkey in the global refugee issue. Um, first of all, Turkey now hosts the largest uh, refugee population uh, in the world. Uh, we are all aware of the fact that the solution to migration crises are beyond the means of a single country and uh, it requires international uh, burden sharing. Uh, Turkey and uh, EU successfully reached uh, an agreement uh, on the refugee issue uh, on uh, 18 March 2000, uh, 2016, uh, almost five years ago. Uh, I believe uh, uh, uh, renewal and update of the agreement between the uh, Brussels uh, and Ankara, EU and Turkey, 
should be one of the top issue for a policy agenda uh, this year uh, of 2021. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, while closing down school activities uh, due to COVID-19 affected all children, the lives of refugee and migrant children were particularly touched. For them, going to school, meeting new friends and going out of the refugee camps brought them out of the, their uh, secret existence to a sense of normalcy and joy of being together with other children. For these children, uh, schools is above a uh, hope for a brighter future, a uh, good future. Uh, the situation has put additional uh, strain on education professionals to find new uh, creative ways to organize an uh, adopted education process for refugee and migrant children outside classrooms. Uh, as the lockdown in many countries uh, shows no sign of easing, uh, continuing education through uh, attractive learning pathways must be a top priority for all children, including refugee and migrant children. Uh, and in the short term, this means uh, ensuring access uh, free access to learning uh, through temporary mode, alternative or distance learning. Uh, I, I mentioned it's important for uh, uh, education is not overlooked while we return to some sort of normality. Uh, it should not be overlooked in state strategies and in donor strategies. It's important. Emergency responses should not prevent constructive learning opportunities, which create a safe space for children to learn, grow and uh, regain a sense of hope in their future. Uh, finally speaking, dear friends, uh, before I finish, I would like to thank uh, Association for Solidarity and Asylum Seekers and Migrants, ASAM, for their dedicated work and effort for the refugees. Uh, I observe uh, they do a, a courageous work in terms of providing inform on refugees and assisting refugees in most part of Turkey. I hope this digital meeting will lead to more productive, more effective and concrete projects between our friendship group and uh, ASAM in close future. I would like uh, once again uh, to thank your participation uh, and look forward to, to a fruitful discussion. Thank you for your encouraging words, Mr. Czarnecki. Thank you for your Thank you for sparing some precious time of yours and joining this online event. So we have come to an end to the first session. While we are getting ready for the second one, we will watch a video clip, which was taken from one of our events held maybe a couple of years ago. As you may already know, every year we celebrate the opening of the Grand National Assembly on the 23rd of April. And the founder of the Republic of Turkey, great leader Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, dedicated this special day to children, not just children from Turkey, children from all around the world. So we thought, why not gather refugee children with Turkish children and on this special occasion? And the result turned out to be great. Ladies and gentlemen, let's watch this video clip. And I would like to thank all of our participants for joining us, for joining this online event. You put value to this uh, special occasion. Thank you all. And let's watch this joyful video clip. Orası 
benim ülkem ama burayı da çok seviyorum. Ülkemize misafir olarak geldiler. İyi ki de geldiler. Yine arkadaşlarımız oldu. Çok mutlu olduk. Çok eğlenceli bile şarkı söyledik. Çocuklar herkes alkışladı bize. Geçen sene gelmişlerdi. Ben gelmemiştim. Ya çok heyecanlıydım. Çok gelmek istiyordum. Ee, geldim de çok güzeldi. Oynadım, yemek yedim. Çok mutlu. Çok güzel arkadaşlar var.
Okay, that's perfect. You can close it now. We're back, we're live. You are watching this special event, which is hosted by EU Turkey Friendship Group and Assam Brussels and Assam headquarters as well. Our topic is refugee children and education, inclusion and improvement for a better future. In the first session, we had opening statements and then we're gonna much dig this topic a little bit more with our experts. The first one is Mart Aro. Hello, Mart. Let me introduce you first. Since 2004, Mart Aro has co-founded three NGOs and four companies for education development. Mart co-authored the Youth Good Ideas book in 2005. The book brings together the life experiences of 40 leads in Estonia. He is joining us from Estonia, by the way. Uh, with the objective of 
inspiring youth to find their path. He's joining us from Tallinn. Tallinn is the most lovable uh, city in uh, Estonia. I've been there once. Super city. So uh, tell me, Mark, we have uh, participants from all over Europe and all over the world, may I say. Uh, we are uh, participating this event from Brussels. Uh, our HQ uh, in Ankara is involved. You are from Tallinn, Estonia. Is it not the most international uh, event that you uh, attended during the last couple of weeks? Huh? <laughs> Probably is very likely. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, Mart Aro, please. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. And uh, I uh, really appreciate the work that Assam is doing uh, in Turkey. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor uh, to, to be invited to, to this kind of uh, company. Um, from my background you gave a really beautiful overview already but um, i'm uh, really delighted to uh, um, to mention that uh, the cooperation with turkey from my side has been very long actually uh, we have uh, cooperation with quite a few turkish universities um, for example Koch university middle east technical university are really good partners uh, and um, uh, our colleague in, in Europe, Ms. Uh, Ipek uh, Tektemir, is uh, really uh, a, a big asset uh, and she's been helping uh, a lot uh, on, on our efforts in, in, in the European Union. So, uh, uh, really great cooperation experience and I really love Istanbul. I've been many times uh, and uh, Izmir and Ankara, of course, as well. And uh, uh, it's... it's uh, I'm, uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about uh, during this pandemic has been when can I go back to Turkey again? So it's uh, looking forward, looking forward to this. And uh, we also have started dialogue with the Turkish Ministry of Education uh, for uh, education innovation development uh, uh, in cooperation between Turkey and Estonia. So um, uh, looking forward to see how this develops as well. But uh, I'll dig into a small presentation that I prepared for today, and I'll share my screen for this. Uh, share screen. Start sharing. And can you confirm that it works? It is working. It's working perfectly well. Perfect. And yes, now I will see also my Skype messages on my screen. Um, but <laughs> the topic that I wanted to open up uh, from uh, refugees' perspective is uh, one of the innovations that we've been working on together with um, uh, your, uh, the UN and uh, also um, uh, the World Bank is um, uh, reusable uh, uh, services for education development. and. Um, but, but I'll give you a little bit of uh, background first. So I'm coming from the future. And in this future, 99% uh, of government services are online. Doing taxes takes about three minutes. Uh, establishing a company takes about 20 minutes. Voting for parliament is also done online. And internet is considered a human right. And, and this place is not uh, keeping stuff to themselves. They have opened it up for the whole of the world through e-residency program. Do you know where I'm coming from? It's Estonia, of course. Uh, uh, uh, oh, uh, I, I'm going to say, I was going to say I have no idea, but uh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, so Estonia has a quite good experience in setting up uh, digital services for uh, helping or supporting the, uh, the, the citizens. And um, I like to bring this background just to uh, give a statement or an understanding that everything that I'm talking about is actually possible and, and not that far out of reach uh, as you might uh, imagine. Uh, my dream, why I'm, why I'm working with education development is to enable access to high quality education to everybody globally. And um, uh, indeed, it's been already 17 years and quite a lot of things have been done as well. Uh, one of the uh, initiatives that, uh, from my personal work, uh, goes together with um, uh, supporting international people uh, to go to study is actually Dream Apply. It's now operating in 35 countries already, and um, it's a student admissions and marketing management platform for universities. But we started to build it actually from the students' perspective to help students to go to study 
uh, abroad. And also, if you're already living abroad and want to go to the university in the country where you're living in, and, and the university uses Streamapply, it is a great opportunity to uh, to understand better um, what is expected from you and, and how you can, uh, can apply there. And, and the students' feedback has been really uh, lovely. There is now probably around 3 million uh, students using Dreamapply this year. But uh, let's go deeper now into the innovation side. <clears throat> um, and let's say uh, if we want to uh, improve the quality of access to education to uh, also people that have, uh, um, due to whatever circumstances, ended up in a foreign country, um, then uh, the question is how can we support them the best way? And um, if we look back in, in education history, then innovation is not, nothing new in education sector. So uh, we are always used to do innovation in education. And uh, this is a Gutenberg's printing press, and it's from 1440s. So, and and uh, this is probably the most impactful innovation we have had throughout the history of education. Uh, thanks to the books that were starting to come become much cheaper thanks to the printing press, um, uh, a lot of uh, knowledge was was possible to uh, pass over to other countries and and also people within the countries. But going back to the Lego blocks of learning, so uh, let's imagine when we could have uh, different types of learning pieces that we can combine together in a way that is most useful for the learner, uh, then um, it, it can most easily draw a parallel with the Lego blocks that you can combine together. And um, what this means is that, <clears throat> why this is important is that when we look at education development, then um, very often the governments are looking at it like a monolithic, uh, like one big system that you have to develop at once. And, uh, and everybody should get the uniform education. But if we talk about, uh, uh, let's say, immigrants uh, specifically, then very often this uh, approach is hard to apply. Um, and uh, a, a much more easy approach could be uh, um, used, which is called microservices-based uh, approach. And microservices literally are uh, very narrow services that are meant for learning certain things. The, the microservices-based um, approach can be used in, in many aspects, uh, also outside of education. But uh, in education sector, we feel that this is uh, critical uh, development. And I'll give just a few examples of why it is like that. So uh, let's imagine that uh, we would have an endless budget to build the best possible system that would cover everything that we want to learn in our lifetime. And let's imagine that one person wants to learn about 2 million learning bytes. We want to know about 2 million different things. So and let's say we, we make a public tender. We bet, get the best possible company from the world to come and build our uh, large system to, to, to serve all education. Then uh, even if we are uh, getting the best company, uh, very likely the, the best company will only be able to cover, let's say, 200,000 of these 2 million learning bytes with high quality expertise that is able to understand exactly how we should teach this thing in the best possible way. 200,000 is, is great, but it's only 10% of the 2 million, which, which will mean that the other areas will not be covered with expertise, and uh, which will mean that the, the solutions will be average or below average quality. And now if we ask, okay, but do we, have, do we want to give average or below average education services to our children? And obviously the answer is no. So <clears throat> um, another issue that you will have is that let's get, let's say we get the best programmers to build the system. We get the system ready in super fast time. It, it only takes us five years. Um, and, and then we launch the system. And what happens is that we find out that it's already morally uh, outdated and technologically outdated by the time it's, it's ready. So to avoid these hassles, uh, the microservices approach is actually really um, interesting because <clears throat> even if you don't have any expertise uh, available on a super narrow niche, for example, we want to have a specialist tool to teach multiplication table to hyperactive children. It's quite easy to imagine that there is a tool. Almost all teachers in the world are struggling with hyperactive children so uh, everybody needs this tool. Uh, but um, uh, let's say there is no expertise in, in this area. 
there is nobody who knows exactly how to teach my, uh, uh, multiplication table to hyperactive children. Now, if there is a specialist team that starts to build this kind of uh, tool to support teachers and learners, then even if they don't have expertise in the beginning, very likely they will develop the expertise while building this because they are focused on uh, solving this concrete task in the highest possible quality manner. And uh, uh, now if you imagine that you have two million of these types of different tools that are specially designed for learning something the best possible way in the world, and uh, you would of course need an infrastructure in place that would facilitate uh, that that the learners and the teachers could very conveniently also use these tools and move from one tool to another uh, conveniently. But in the end of the day, they're very easily comparable to Lego blocks because you can combine them uh, easily. Um, I will also uh, bring out a few examples. So one of the things that we have done during the COVID crisis uh, to support teachers and learners uh, in, in uh, need for distance learning tools was that over the Northern Europe, we invited companies and, and uh, solution providers uh, to open up their resources for free. And, and this uh, got the name Teach Millions. In total, 125 companies joined this initiative. And it's still possible to use this resource in case uh, learners uh, that, um, that would like to learn something uh, or the teachers who, who need some distance learning tools want to use it, uh, go ahead. Uh, and just to give you two very brief examples of, of already existing microservices based uh, approach examples. Um, I, I just took two because we don't have a lot of time to cover um, uh, examples, but, uh, but I hope this um, helps to understand what I have in mind. So the Grafo game is a great example because actually this was invented by one of the top teacher training universities in Finland, um, uh, which is called Jyväskylä University. And um, uh, the problem that they wanted to solve was that uh, they saw that a lot of kids um, have difficulties to learn how to read, and especially if the kids have uh, like specialist uh, or let's say uh, disabilities, let's say. Um, and, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and then what happens is that very often these kids learn one on one with the teacher and uh, let's say if in case of dyslexia, it can happen that uh, it, it takes tens and tens of work hours uh, of both time, uh, the, uh, the teacher spends one on one with the with the learner, but the learner is not able to learn still how to read uh, because uh, of of uh, speci special con uh, con condition. So, uh, so they came up with a better methodology how to teach reading in general, and um, uh, they didn't know exactly how to make it into a product that everybody could use globally. So they turned to a, a Finnish startup. Uh, in education and, and the startup was kind enough to make it into a product and let's have a quick look at how it looks like. In thin can tip So uh, why I like this uh, kind of innovation of education is that um, uh, Cambridge University actually did a study as well on this and, and they found that there was no difference if the child is learning alone with the app or if the teacher is sitting together with the child and, the, and they are learning together. Uh, the child will learn uh, the same fast uh, how to read and, uh, it, and this methodology is suitable then for, for also different kind of learning uh, differences of, of children. So and, and, and the children don't have this kind of negative learning experience when they when they are using this kind of um, gamified approach that we, we looked at at the moment. Um, and it's uh, because it's possible to use it globally, the cost of the solution also becomes very small uh, per, per learner. Uh, I think, uh, I, don't, don't, don't quote me on this, but I think the cost for a learner is now about 26 cents uh, for, for using this, uh, this game if it's uh, negotiated on the country level. So, um, which is almost nothing, as, as everybody probably can agree. Um, and um, why I like this kind of innovation also is um, uh, that we can save teachers time on certain areas of, of teaching. And I, I know many teachers and, and um, I know that many, most of them are overworking to, uh, to try to give the best possible uh, education to the children that, uh, that they can. Um, but um, if you have 
I mean, in the normal middle school, teacher has 200 kids that they're working with on a weekly level, weekly basis. So it can be really difficult to to to find the time to work personally with the children. But if you if you have this kind of tools available that can open up the teacher's time a little bit, the teachers know super well how to take this time and apply this to support this child in the back seat who is for some reason having difficulties to focus today and and uh, uh, whatever the reason might be. And uh, just to have, have a total different perspective, uh, how we can make learning a, lo a, a lo little bit more engaging, let's say maybe, or or more easily understandable for children. I chose to, to tr show Mobilab, which is an Estonian uh, solution provider for education. And uh, just as a background uh, inspiration. Welcome, Commander Riker. And if you care to enter, Commander. I do. So here we are looking at the Star Trek movie from probably 1988, where uh, Commander Riker is stepping into uh, what, what they call holodeck. This is a digital learning environment uh, which will transform into this kind of environment what you actually need at the moment to support your learning. And um, actually this uh, concept is not, uh, not new at all. Uh, the first time that I was able to find that it was mentioned was um, in a book uh, by Ray Bradbury in 19, 1950 already. So, um, um, but today uh, we are getting closer and closer to uh, realizing this kind of possibilities of uh, bringing children to a specialist environment and teaching them how to, um, well, teaching about this environment or, or teaching how to behave in a certain environment. Uh, so, and uh, the example of, uh, of the company is here. And here we are seeing an, uh, a virtual room that we are setting in, set, stepping in and we are able to, to learn about this environment that we stepped into and we can hear the sounds as well. And uh, for example, we can use a tablet computer to, to do this kind of rooms. And, um, and it, it can be, I mean, I'll give you a simple example. So let's say you are supposed to teach or learn about uh, Amazon jungle uh, in a class of geography. And um, now let's imagine you're, you have an opportunity to read about Amazon jungle um, and, and there are maybe some pictures in the book as well. Uh, or you have an opportunity to take your, your teammates or group mates and go together into a virtual room and look around there and experience the sounds and, and, and maybe even um, kind of uh, zoom into the frogs that are sitting in the jungle or something like that. Which way could be easier uh, to remember uh, what actually is happening in the jungle? I, I believe everybody can agree that that's very likely uh, uh, the augmented reality that helps us to, to remember things. I, I don't want to take more of the time at the moment. Um, thanks very much for your, for listening. Don't hesitate to connect with me in LinkedIn if you'd like to know more of the concepts that I've, I've talked about. Uh, more than happy to, to share more info or, uh, um, yeah, just... Uh, discuss further actually on my website uh, martaro.me uh, some of the concepts that I've talked about are, are also um, uh, described in, in more details. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Such a different approach to education. I myself am fascinated by your presentation and when you were talking about uh, Tallinn without saying anything with, uh, without saying anything that you are talking about Estonia uh, I said no way he is living in a dream world, but you said that is an that is a fact. So, actually, there is, we even have a joke about this. <clears throat> there is, uh, uh, three things that you cannot do online in Estonia: you cannot get married, you cannot uh -huh. get divorced, and you cannot buy or sell your house. <laughs> okay, that that's good to know. That's good to know. Thank you. And we are moving forward to dig. A little bit more on this topic, refugee children and education, inclusion and improvement for a better future. We are now going to hear from Ibrahim Burgun Kavlak, General Coordinator of Assam. Let me introduce you first, Ibrahim Bey. He received a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Hacettepe University and he earned a master's degree in human rights from Hacettepe University as well in 2007. Since 2005, Ibrahim Murgun Kavlak has been the general coordinator of ASAM, and ASAM is the most important implementing partners of 
several UN organizations, international organizations, and public institutions. So he is the key guy. He is the guy when thousands of people rushed to Edirne, to Greek-Turkey border, one year ago, who gathered a crew, Ibrahim Bey gathered a crew, and organized humanitarian aid to those people in need, even though he and everybody was struggling with the fact that COVID-19 was everywhere and is everywhere. So, shall I say, he is a brave heart like Mel Gibson, but a much more good-looking version of Mel Gibson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you, Ibrahim Vorgun Kavlak. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Murat, for your good words. Distinguished ambassadors, honorable members of the EU Turkey Friendship Group, honorable members of United Nations organizations, respectful academicians, uh, staff of NGOs, uh, dear participants, uh, I welcome you all to this conference organized by Assam Brussels representative uh, office. Without getting into further details about the issues that uh, Mr. Murat uh, Boris Korab uh, already mentioned uh, about Assam, I would like to remind you some of general information of which you are all aware. Uh, unfortunately, we are currently uh, living in a world where 25 persons per minute, 37,000 persons per day, and one person every two seconds are forced to leave behind uh, their territories. Turkey still maintains uh, its position as the country hosting the highest number of refugees in the world for the last five years. While 65% of the Syrian refugees form 3.6 million of Turkey's uh, population, a total population of uh, 4 million with approximately 400,000 persons from different nationalities, and the majority being Afghans, Iraqis, and Iranians continues to stay in Turkey. Approximately worldwide, 3.7 million refugee children are still unable to access to education. Children constitute over 30 million of the displaced persons, it is worth noting that 7.4 million of this group are of school age. When we look at the, uh, Turkey again, keeping in mind that the Syrian crisis will be completing its 10th year two months from now, you can see the increasing population over the years. However, just 10 Ten years ago, in 2011, the total asylum seeker and refugee population in Turkey was only 20,000, according to the uh, UNHCR statistics. Similarly, when looking at the most densely populated cities, we can say that many of them are practically hosting an entire city. At this very point, to show how uh, striking the population actually is, when we compare the population of the 0 to 18 age group with the children born in Turkey included, and the total Syrian population to the population of each of the EU states, we see these figures. There's a population living in Turkey that exceeds the combined population of eight EU states. This is an indication that the efforts to be made and must be made for this population creates a variety and significance that nearly requires governance just as a country does. Of course, if we also include the number of non-Syrians in addition to the Syrian population, the total population goes up one step further and reaches 4 million. In this regard, with the valuable contributions of the European Union and United Nations organizations, uh, we as uh, an NGO have reached 2,295,700 persons within the last uh, five years and uh, provided over 4 million counseling services. These services range from 
legal counseling to health counseling and from vocational trainings to social cohesion activities. Perhaps women and children constitute the most important part of this population, but especially considering children and uh, education over the years, it is worth mentioning that currently there are 1.2 million school age children in Turkey. According to the uh, official uh, numbers, while uh, 765, uh, 68,000 839 Syrian children have access to education from this population of 1.2 million children. Approximately 430,000 children are unfortunately unable to uh, access school due to various reasons. Refugee children are again present uh, among the groups that have been affected the most by the pandemic uh, within the last one year. In Turkey, Students can have access to education via both formal and non-formal education opportunities. Uh, formal education is a structured and systematic form of uh, learning. This is the education of certain standards delivered to students by trained teachers. Non-formal education refers to uh, education that occurs outside the formal school system. The Ministry of National Education is the uh, sole authority uh, for regulating formal and non-formal education. When we look at the figures in question, uh, we can draw the conclusion that there is a heavy burden that needs to be shouldered, uh, that there is still too much work to be done, and that in this sense, the international community should provide more support to prevent facing the risk of a uh, lost uh, generation. Perhaps there is no need to go into further details about the reasons for being out of uh, school as the UNICEF representative will surely mention about them, but it is worth noting that the lack of schooling results in, in a highly number of uh, protection-related concerns as well. Many protection concerns, especially issues such as child labor, early marriage, and social cohesion problems may also emerge. In this connection, as Assam, uh, we have uh, collaborated with UNICEF Turkey and conducted joint works to increase uh, access to education during the last one year. To this end, we have conducted uh, identification and assessment works and made referrals to non-formal and formal education opportunities. Currently, we have reached 50,000 children and their families. Also, in order to ensure that COVID-19 does not cause an interruption in the operation of our current works, uh, we offer counseling services to these refugee groups nearly 120,000 times, and more than 17,000 families and children were provided with counseling on changing education methods. Before concluding my remarks, uh, I would like uh, to uh, say a final uh, words about the birth rates and youth population statistics I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, as well as the notion of voluntary return, uh, which has recently become a hot topic of discussion as we are nearing the 11th year of the crisis. The child and youth population age between 0 to 24 is over 2.2 million. Regretfully, we cannot possibly mention that this group shares deep emotional, cultural, historical, and social ties with Syria. In consideration of this fact, the more time passes, the more difficult it becomes for this population to return. Therefore, for the future of both Syria and the countries where Syrians sought asylum, especially like Turkey, increased support should be given to children and their education in order to prevent them from becoming a lost generation. I would like to express my uh, sincere thanks to Assam's Brussels uh, representative, Murat Barış Koral, uh, to the EU Turkey Friendship Group's Secretary General Ipek Dekdemir 
and to everyone who contributed to the organization of this event. And I wish you healthy days ahead uh, with no masks and no distancing rules in many more events to come. Uh, thank you very much and uh, best regards. Thank you very much, Ibrahim Burgun Kavlak. I share your thoughts about not wearing a mask and not uh, social distancing with others. Thank you for your lovely speech. And now we have more than 800 viewers live on YouTube, which is fascinating. Uh, I mean, this is the thing. Uh, this is the good thing about doing this kind of uh, virtual events. That would not be possible if we did this not online in a in a meeting hall, maybe. Now we have more than 800 viewers. So let's move forward and let's hear from Brenda Haplik, Chief of Education at UNICEF Turkey. Let me introduce you first, uh, Brenda. Since August 2016, Brenda Haplik has been the Chief of Education at UNICEF Turkey, where she manages a large and complex educational portfolio spanning the humanitarian development nexus. Before her current posting, she was the Senior Education Advisor Emergencies at UNICEF HQ in New York. She holds a PhD in Curriculum, Teaching and Learning with a specialization in Comparative International and Development Education from University of Toronto, Canada. So she is familiar with cold weather. Well, regarding that, she's coming from Canada and should be safe in Ankara in cold weather, I think. Uh, how are you holding up, Brenda Heplik? It's a warm day here. It's above zero. No problem. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> it, it is considered warm, huh? For me, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, Brenda Heplik. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my my presentation on the screen in front of you? I think our technical team will support you with that. Go ahead and okay. don't worry about it. Okay, so thank you for this invitation. It's great to be here today. I want to dig deep into what's happening with a response to the Syria crisis in the context of Turkey. And also talk about the pandemic, which we've already heard mentioned today. As you heard Ibrahim Bey say, Turkey hosts the largest refugee population in the world. Next slide, please. And within that, 46% are children. So it's a large group of young people. Also, as you heard, there are asylum seekers who are also part of uh, the response in the education sector. In Turkey, the Ministry of National Education is the lead agency that coordinates the response for the Syria crisis, both in the formal education and non-formal education sectors. And the ministry works with partners like UNICEF, UNHCR, ASAM and other trusted NGOs to ensure that quality education is available to all children. Next slide, please. The history of this is on one slide here and you'll see very quickly, I'll take you through what has happened over the last several years. In 2012, 12 years of compulsory education became a uh, standard uh, in Turkey, which is significant because many of the Syrians coming to us here in Turkey are only used to going up to grade nine as part of compulsory education in their home country. So that's an added burden on families to think about additional years of education beyond grade nine. 2014 was a very important year because the Ministry of National Education passed a circular allowing for the enrollment of Syrian children into, Turkish, uh, into the Turkish system, specifically into temporary education centers, TECs, that were uh, manned with uh, Syrian teachers, supported by the ministry, and the children were studying in Arabic. Because then, several years ago, everyone hoped and prayed that the crisis would end and that Syrian children could go home with their families. Unfortunately, we all know that the, the conflict continues. In 2015, the ministry started registering Syrian children into Turkish public schools because it was decided that the crisis was not going to uh, end anytime soon and it made sense for children to enter the Turkish public system since they would be staying in country for some time. Then in 2016, the integration policy was implemented across the, the whole country, including the fact that any new pre-primary level and grade one students would not go into a TEC at all, they would go directly into a Turkish public school. 
2018, another really important year because the ministry's Education Vision 2023 document was launched, setting the footing for the way forward, including inclusive education for all children in Turkey. Also in 2018, the non-formal education programs began to expand under Monet's leadership, including the very uh, inclusive, highly successful accelerated learning program, which helps out of school children, primarily Syrian children, but others as well, have a jump start and a bridging program that will link them back into the Turkish system after they've been out of school for a long time. Homework support in innovative ways has also been uh, supported since 2018. And then end of 2020, and now still we have this pandemic that we're all facing. And the pandemic is definitely a health crisis, but in education around the world, it is also very much an education crisis. And we've been working as a sector uh, partners to support the ministry to enhance its EBA online teaching and learning system so that children can study online remotely and safely from home. The goal being to continue education. Lastly, very important in 2020, uh, the TECs, Temporary Education Centers, were closed, which means that now all Syrian children enter Turkish public schools and study with Turkish children. Next slide, please. So there are over 1 million Syrian school-aged children in Turkey at present. And as I said, most of those children, about 64.2%, are in Turkish public schools. The issue that we have though here is that even though the number of children entering Turkish public schools has grown, we still have over 400,000 Syrian children and other children out of school, which is significant and that's a key area of work. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit now about why children are out of school and why children have low attendance issues. Next slide, please. UNICEF and Monet have worked hard to try to understand the profiles of out-of-school children in Turkey, specifically focusing in this slide on the issues for Syrian children. And you'll see some of these, these reasons on this slide. One is family mobility. Families often move uh, chasing livelihood opportunities, which means that they go from the province they're registered in to another province, making it very difficult to re-register in a new province. Financial difficulties particularly exacerbated now in the COVID-19 pandemic. Children are participating in, in, in work, child labor. There are also hidden costs associated with education. For example, transportation costs to go to and from school, which affect families. Gender norms. You've got girls who are expected to stay at home and manage uh, household chores and take care of younger siblings while their parents are working. Some girls are affected by child marriage. And for some conservative families, they are uncomfortable sending their girls to mixed schools where they would study with boys. So there are many challenges for, for girls and other challenges also for boys. There are demotivating factors like language. To survive and thrive in Turkey in the Turkish public school system, it really helps to learn Turkish because it's the language of instruction. If children have been out of school for a long time, it's very difficult to bring them back into a learning setting and make them feel comfortable. If a child has an illness or is disabled, or if a parent, uh, especially fathers, are, are sick, the child will be uh, regarded as a, a breadwinner in the family and therefore miss school. And social cohesion, which we heard about already. There are issues around bullying in school, uh, in classrooms, on playgrounds, online, now with online learning and living. And finally, the awareness about families. In spite of the fact that this conflict has been going on for so many years and access to information is there, it is still very hard for many very vulnerable families to understand what the options are for them. That's why it's so important for us to have partners like Assam who go household to household and explain what options are available to vulnerable children and their families. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about the COVID response because on top of helping millions of children enter the Turkish school system here in Turkey, we are also now de dealing with this pandemic, which is wreaking havoc on the education system. Schools have been closed since March. Uh, we hope very much they will reopen in some form in mid-February after the current winter break. One thing that's been interesting is that 
The whole point of, of Monet, the ministry's approach, has been to continue learning in safe spaces through distance education modalities. So the EBA system has been used to uh, support children safely continue learning at home. And UNICEF has supported that effort by enhancing the network. In addition, we've also helped the ministry prepare additional classroom videos uh, about vocational education. Because for many uh, children, uh, Syrian children and vulnerable other children, vo vocational training provides very useful, relevant life skills that they can use in their everyday lives. And lastly, teachers are critical to this work. UNICEF has worked with the ministry to train over 196,000 teachers and principals, local educators, to make sure that they are equipped and have the tips and tricks and tools to manage in this highly demanding remote environment. Next slide, please. Again, the theme of the continuity of learning using blended approaches. Blended meaning some face-to-face -face when it is safe to do so, and some online learning combined. Now, this EBA system is great if you have a television set, if you have internet connectivity at home, and if you have a phone. But if you don't, like many uh, very vulnerable families don't have these options, then they can go to an EBA remote support center, which is basically a place which is a safe space, a computer lab, if you will, with, with a teacher or two. Masks are provided, hand sanitizers are provided, and children can study in a classroom environment and benefit from face-to-face -face support from their teachers. In some remote areas, there are also EBA mobile vehicles, trucks that go from, from location to location to support children in the same way. During the summer months, when vulnerable children were at home and we were all very much under lockdown here in Turkey, UNICEF worked with the ministry and partners to send learn at home kits stationary, some basic reading materials to vulnerable children so that they could keep engaging and learning at home with their families. UNICEF also has supported over 12,000 Syrian volunteer education personnel to reinforce uh, learning for Syrian children. During the pandemic, Syrian volunteers are, are working with children to get them to EBA centers so they can continue learning and calling children through WhatsApp, by phone, and if possible, visiting children as well. I mentioned already that learning Turkish is critical. So supporting Turkish language skills and learning for vulnerable children, including out of school children is important work. And that continues with NGO partners and the government. And lastly, homework support is critical because in this time of the pandemic, when children are very isolated at home, knowing that they can talk to their teachers on phone online to get homework support is really, really helpful. We had some good results in that area. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about the bookends, the youngest learners at preschool level and adolescents. These are two of the most vulnerable groups uh, for Syrian learners, but also for other learners in Turkey. What we've done with the little ones is worked with them, the ministry and partners to provide, to move all of our face-to-face -face learning online. And there have been some wonderful serendipitous bonuses from that. For example, because fathers have been at home now during lockdown times, fathers have become more engaged remotely using WhatsApp uh, materials and remote parental support in the development of their young children. Uh, in addition, UNICEF has worked with the ministry to enhance the safe learning environments at public education centers where the accelerated learning program takes place. And I'm very happy to say that the ALP is now up and running again, face to face in many parts of the country. Uh, targeting some of the most vulnerable learners who have been out of school for several years. Also, children uh, adolescent age are able in 10 provinces to benefit from the schooling adolescence through vocational education program and benefit from the VEC's face-to-face -face learning programs. Next slide, please. Now, I keep saying face-to-face -face over and over, and one reason for that is even as adults, we all know how tough this last year has been on our mental health, on our emotional well-being. It's the same thing for all human beings, and especially for young students who have been out of school, and for refugees, even more so. So we've worked to prioritize the mental uh, health and emotional well-being of students, teachers, and parents during these difficult, challenging days. 
We've worked with the ministry to create a mental health psychosocial support program to help increase the resilience of students, teachers, and their parents during the pandemic, and to help them get used to the new normal, which is the blended learning approach for now until the foreseeable uh, time when things change. We've also worked to include psychosocial support materials for children who are not performing at the levels they should be uh, to participate in the remedial education program run by the Ministry of National Education and to make sure that hard copy materials for that program have been distributed to most schools across the country. Lastly, in this area of work, we've worked with the Ministry's Counseling and Research Centres, the RAMS, to adapt and enhance the quality of counseling and special education services which are extremely important during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Lastly, the way we communicate with the refugee population in Turkey, both before the pandemic began and now, is really critical. So UNICEF has worked with the ministry and partners in the education sector working groups across the country on a nationwide back to school campaign with the key message being at school, at home, education, anytime, anywhere. So the whole message of blended learning, it doesn't matter if you're stuck at home, you can still learn. And if you can't learn at home because you don't have an internet connection, you don't have a television or a phone, you can go to an EBA support center that the ministry is running in neighborhoods around the country and learn face to face. So part of this messaging campaign, we've supported the ministry in messaging clearly in September and October 2020 when schools did reopen and to help schools go back in an organized manner. As you know from many countries around the world listening to the news, schools have opened, then they've closed. Youngest learners have gone back, then they've been pulled home. The old, some countries prioritize older learners because they're studying for exams. We're facing the same challenges here in Turkey, and the sector and Mone colleagues are working together to make sure the most vulnerable learners get the face-to-face -face time they need. So for example, after the uh, February break, uh, it is anticipated uh, that perhaps the grade 8 children and grade 12 children would get some face-to-face -face education because they're the ones who are going to be writing the very important transition exams that determine their way forward. However, this is all a, a very much a hope. We don't know, depending on the ep epidemiological situation in Turkey and around the world, hopefully schools will reopen in, in mid-February if all goes well. So... A refugee crisis, a health crisis, an education crisis. Ibrahim Bey noted the connection between child protection issues and education. He, he couldn't be more right. Everything we do is to help keep children safe and to continue learning during any kind of environment and context. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brenda Hedwig. I myself admire the work that you have done in Turkey and all around the world. And I am a fan of your UNICEF cards as well. I have a big collection back at home. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Uh, I think we have come to an end to this second session as well. Uh, we have like 1,000 weavers on YouTube that I can consider the job well done. So next time it will be again maybe on uh, internet, but it's going to connect us and we're going to get uh, overcome these serious problems, whatever they are. So thank you for thank you all for joining us on this live event. Hope to see you again in healthy days. Thank you for joining us and bye bye.